sights in the universe now on BBC One and you don't need expensive kit to see it, as Patrick Moore explains. Look up into the southern sky and there you will see a bright star-like object which is in fact the planet Saturn. The world with rings, in my view, the loveliest thing in the entire sky. So let's have a rundown on Saturn. First of all, it's big, nearly 75,000 miles across, far larger than Earth, but not so massive as you might think. It's not solid in the way that the Earth is. There's a solid core, solid by gas and liquid, what we are seeing is the top part of the atmosphere, a layer of gas, mainly hydrogen, with a good deal of helium. Now Saturn goes around the Sun once in 29 and a half years, has a very short day, less than 10 hours long, and spins so quickly it's flattened. Look at Saturn through the telescope, and you see the yellowish flattened disk surrounded by the rings. And these are made of icy particles, all spinning around Saturn like tiny moons. They measure 170,000 miles from one end to the other, but they're very thin, less than a mile thick, so when they turn edgewise onto us, they almost vanish. At the moment, they are well seen. Also, Saturn has a whole family of moons. One big one, Titan, bigger than Mercury, with a dense nitrogen atmosphere. There were seven fairly large icy satellites and quite a number of smaller ones. So there is Saturn for you. See, one of the loveliest thing in the sky. Saturn is well seen now, so let's go into my garden and join Chris Lawrence and Pete Lawrence, who have a telescope there, waiting to see Saturn, clouds permitting. Well, Pete, it's cloudy. In fact, it, it's beginning to rain again. But if it weren't, we'd be able to see my favourite object, Saturn. Saturn is very well placed at the moment in the constellation of Leo the Lion. The best way to find it is to use our old friend, the, uh, the, the saucepan, or plough, Big Dipper, whatever you want to call it. But I'll call it the saucepan, that's easier to visualise at the moment. And if you can find the saucepan, locate the pan of the saucepan, the two stars on the in the pan on the opposite side from the handle are called the pointers. They point to the North Star, Polaris. If you follow them up. If you follow them up. If you find the two stars on the other side of the, the pan and follow them in the reverse direction Downwards. down, you come to, eventually, you come to a brightish star which is called Regulus. That's the brightest star in the constellation of Leo the Lion. And it marks the bottom of the backwards question mark of Leo's head. It does indeed. It's the punctuation dot at the, the bottom of that question mark. And Saturn at the moment is slightly to the right and up a bit from a Regulus. And it, it actually forms a box shape, um, Saturn to Regulus and then two stars of the sickle asterism form a box in the sky. It's quite, quite noticeable. Oh, it's, a, it's absolutely unmistakable. There's nothing else that bright around it. And with the naked eye, of course, it's just a point of light moving against the background stars from night to night. What do we see in binoculars? OK, with a pair of binoculars, you're not going to see much of the planet, um, unless they're very high-powered and they're mounted on a tripod, of course. But it, uh, for the average pair of binoculars, you're not going to see very much of the planet itself. But you will be able to pick out the brightest moon, Titan, and that moves gradually around the planet from night to night. And with a small telescope, everything becomes possible. It does. I mean, this, this is where we get the wow factor with a small telescope, because then you can start to up the magnification a bit and you can start to see detail on the planet itself and, of course, those wonderful rings. And it is quite a subtle planet, so some simple things can help. Taking the telescope outside, for example. Well, one of the things which trips people up more than anything else, especially with small portable telescopes, um, is that they take them outside, they point them at Saturn and they look at the, at the planet and it's a blob just moving about. And the reason for that is the telescope hasn't had time to cool down and reach thermal equilibrium. And it takes, I mean really what you should do is take your telescope outside and give it at least half an hour, preferably a, a couple of hours, um, to get reach a temperature which is the same as the outside air. And when you do that there are no thermal currents and the view will be much better. And you'll see not just the rings but possibly gaps in the rings as the, well. There's a very prominent gap of course which is the Cassini division. Um, and if the seeing, if the air is very steady you can see the Cassini division quite clearly. Well, you have been able to do that over recent years, but 
at the moment the, the rings are beginning to close up. The tilt is beginning to be as such that they're almost flat. In fact, they go flat in 2009 to us. And so this is the time to make the most of Saturn in the evening sky before the rings disappear. Absolutely, yes. Pete, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. The rings are well seen now at that angle. They are closing up and in 2009 they'll return the edgewise onto us and they'll disappear completely in small telescopes. So make the most of Saturn this year. Now, what about spacecraft? The Voyagers, Pioneers, and now the Cassini probe, which is now going round and round the planet. Get all kinds of instruments, and it's only by detailed information about Saturn itself and its moons. It's been a great success, and it still is. I'm joined now by two experts, Professor Michel Dougherty of Imperial College London and Professor John Zarnecki of the Open University. Good to see you both. Hello. Michel, may I come to you first? Of um, course. Cassini is now going around Saturn. What's the latest news? There's lots and lots of news, but I think some of the most exciting news is from Saturn itself. Um, we're beginning to get the idea there's a lot of weather going on yes. on Saturn, and we can see in this particular image here, it's an image from the visual infrared mapping spectrometer on board Cassini, and it's called the String of Pearls. And the reason it's called the String of Pearls are these white pearls that are stretched all the way across Saturn there. They cover about 60,000 kilometers, and you can see they're very clearly at 40 degrees latitude north of the planet. What do they mean? What we think it's saying is that the red background we can see is the thermal heat coming off from the interior of Saturn. And those white dots or white pearls are clearings in the cloud system. And so it's enabling us to see deeper into Saturn itself. Well, Saturn is a, a very quick spinner. It the is. The day there, less than 10 hours long. Um, what's the latest news about the rotation? We keep changing our mind about it. <laughs> That's why I asked you. <laughs> um, the very interesting thing about Saturn is its rotation rate seems to be changing. Depending upon the data sets that we use to try and work out how fast it is, it is actually spinning, it seems to be changing slowly over time. And so all we th can really say at this stage is we're not seeing the deep interior of Saturn. What we're probably seeing are processes taking place on the outside of Saturn that are propagating waves out into the system. And it's those waves that we're seeing. Um, the deep interior itself, we're still not sure what the actual rotation rate is. Of course, there's the question of the magnetic field, and you have aurorae. We certainly do, um, and there are some really nice images of the aurora. This one here yes. shows you a view of the south pole of Saturn. Well, what's the, the blue color? The blue color is methane. Yes. What has happened is electrons have moved down and been excited as they hit the top of the atmosphere, and so the blue images you can see is methane that's been excited in the, in the actual top of the atmosphere. And the black patch? The black patch is probably a polar cloud of some kind. Are the aurorae fairly constant there? They seem to be. It's a bit more difficult for us to tell that it's Saturn, because if we view it from the Earth, we can't always see the, the South Pole, and so it's very difficult for us to be certain of that. But these, this image is in methane, but we've also taken images in the visible light as well. And so the, the aurora, both at the north and the south pole, seem to be there almost all, almost all of the time. Now, Cassini is working well. What's it actually doing at the moment? At the moment, we've just had a flyby of Titan. It was the 25th flyby yeah. of Titan. And then we will move back closer into Saturn and again take some more images of the aurora as we have here. Well, you mentioned Titan. Of course, yes. Titan, Saturn's large satellite, okay. one of the most fascinating worlds in the solar system. Now, we know Titan has a dense atmosphere, all kinds of curious things. Um, well, John, this is your speciality. It is indeed, yes. Well, Huygens was released by the Cassini yes. spacecraft on Christmas Day 2004. Yes. 22 days later, it landed gently on the surface of Titan. And we can see here uh, a little uh, movie that's been put together with the images taken during the descent. And we're just seeing a glimpse of the surface through the clouds. We're moving down, floating down under the parachute. We're seeing uh, light and dark areas. The light areas we think are icy uh, hills. The dark areas are, are, are lower regions, perhaps covered with an organic goo that's been uh, falling from the atmosphere, washed off the hills by uh, uh, river systems, drainage channels, which we can just see uh, towards the left-hand side. 
Now really, uh, very similar to drainage uh, channels, river systems with tributaries that we see on the earth. But not of water? Absolutely not. It's methane, liquid, liquid methane. methane. Yes. And the methane rain. Um, rain and, and drizzle, yes, which uh, we think uh, exist on Titan. We're getting a different view now. The hills are not enormously high here, about at one to two hundred metres. Now we can see the drainage channels, the rivers on the right-hand side. That's right, there they are. We're coming in to land on what we think is a dried up uh, lake bed yeah. on a sort of a, what we'd call a gravel bank. But the gravel, of course, is made not from stony material like on the Earth, Titan is basically an icy body, so it will be gravel made of little chips of, 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 of ice, uh, water ice and, and other materials. Any liquid there now? Well, in not in this area. We landed in a dry area. Well, I say dry, but there's tantalising evidence that here, now you can see the surface mm -hmm. with the pebbles, the icy pebbles. How big are those pebbles? The, the largest is probably only 15 centimetres, 6 inches or so. But we think the ground was damp. There's tantalising evidence that the methane is there just below the surface. And, and you can see the lamp that uh, lit up the surface. The, the heat from that lamp probably evaporated some of the methane and was uh, it was detected by Huygens. You came in a dry area. Uh, is there a kind of lake district? Well, um, we've been looking for it. And last year, on one particular flyby, the Titan radar mapper, that's a, a very sophisticated radar instrument, which sort of scans a strip of Titan every time it flies by, came up with this marvellous image. Here we can see it. It's a, it's a false colour image because what we're seeing is a radar echo of the surface. What do you guys do the colours mean? It's the amount of radio energy that's reflected back from the surface. The yellow, first of all? The yellow, th those are bright regions. Now that's thought to be the underlying icy material. What are the light blue areas? The light blue areas w we think are dried up regions. Uh, sometimes they're surrounding the dark regions, so perhaps we're seeing some of the lakes receding a bit, uh, perhaps we're going into a drier season, and the entirely blue regions are, are regions where lakes have completely dried up. But one large black region there, what's the length of that from one end to the other? That's probably ooh, 70 kilometres or so, so really very significant. And in the entire image we see more than 50 lakes, so we really do seem to have found the lake district on, on Titan. What about the seasons on Titan? Well, we think that they're many years long, probably, you know, 15 years of, of, of summer and 15 years of winter, if we can use those terms. And this would help to explain, perhaps, why we see some lakes that are essentially full of liquid, some that seem to be drying out, and others that definitely are dry. These could well be related to this you know, 15 years of wet and 15 years of dry. Well, Titan has been a real revelation, of course, but people on Saturn tend to come first to the rings that are so lovely. Okay. What's the latest news on the rings? Well, I've got a couple of really good images to show you of the rings. That there is a view which was taken by the imaging camera on board Cassini in September 2006, and it shows us the discovery of a new ring. We can see this very diffuse ring which is out of, outside of the very bright ring that we see, but inside of the start of the E-ring. And it, this new diffuse ring here is at the orbit of Janus and Epimetheus, and it's the first time it's been discovered. And it was quite surprising, actually, because even though we would expect particles to be sputtered off the surface of these moons, we didn't expect that there would be enough of them to actually form a diffuse ring of its own. And so this is the first time that, that this particular ring has been seen. And as we look closer and closer at the rings, we see lots, a lot more structure in them. Because they do affect the magnetic field, don't they? They do, yes. What about these strange spokes in the B-ring? Dark particles, do they appear from out of the shadow? last a bit and then disappear. And they've not been seen recently. No, we've seen them since we've been in orbit with Cassini. We've seen them once, just after we went into orbit. And then I think, I think recently we've seen aren't, them a couple of times. Aren't they thought to be related to, to the dust particles that, that, that make up the rings being l elevated somehow above the ring plane, mm -hmm. maybe by electrostatic forces, magnetic forces, somehow they get, they get picked up. And I, I don't quite see why that would make them appear dark, but certainly it might be a geometric... I remember effect. saying that when I first saw the pictures over a JPL, when it first came through, I said, particle elevated away from the ring plate. But look back on the drawings made years and years ago by people like Antoniardi, and there they are.
they're variable. Could that be a seasonal effect again? It could be, but also one of the things I'm interested in is we think that they rotate around the rings at the rate that the, that the actual planet does. And so we're hoping when we see more of them to try and get a better idea about what the internal rotation rate of the planet is too. Of course, um, the evening could have this weird world, Enceladus. That's right. Enceladus is quite close to my heart. The second big satellite from Saturn. That's about right. 300 miles across, mm -hmm. icy and active. It is. And not only is it active, but it's the source of the E-ring. We can see in this particular image here, there's a view of Enceladus right in the center of the E-ring. And if you look very closely, you can clearly see the plumes coming off from, en from Enceladus that go towards making up the E-ring itself. It's a very large ring. It extends all the way out to Titan, which is over a million kilometers away. And it's really made up mainly of water vapor that's coming off from the south pole of Enceladus. How can a tiny, icy world be as active as that? We think it's got interior heat of some kind. How? We're not quite sure yet. Um, there is something going on which is heating the ice at the South Pole, causing it to essentially break through the surface. And so we have these plumes of water vapor coming off from the South Pole. But also there are signs of some organics coming off the surface as well. And so essentially at Enceladus we have the main building blocks of life. We have liquid water probably beneath the surface and we have organics on the surface. What do you mean by organics? They are molecules of carbon and hydrogen which will go towards forming the basic building blocks of life. And so if you're going to go to search for life on a particular moon or in a particular system, if you have water and you have organics then you have two of the basic building blocks that you need. And you would expect life? Maybe. I don't know whether it is there now. There might have been life there in the past. We're probably not talking about life as we, uh. as we see it on Earth, but back, maybe bacteria of some kind. Um, that's one of the things we need to try and find out when we go back. What about the other inner satellites? Are they inactive? None of them are as active as Enceladus. I mean, that has been the real surprise. Iapetus, though, is also quite remarkable. Much further away from Saturn, about 900 miles across, and um, half bright and half dark. It has this ridge which is almost perfectly al aligned to the equator, and it's a very sharp ridge, isn't it? It's something like, ooh, 15 kilometres. Yes, it's it's nice. a step. It's as if somebody has taken two satellites, Stuck. cut them in two, and, mm. th and then put them together, and they have quite they match. <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite remarkable. It's the most, most unlikely world altogether. It is, absolutely. And, and that, I think, I mean, people really are struggling to explain that uh, sensibly, as we are. Life, Titan, Enceladus, what's your bet? <laughs> I think, I think, I mean, Titan is, I would say, is clearly too cold for, for, for life. Clearly the atmosphere is a factory, a chemical factory, where the molecules which would ultimately lead to life are being built, but it's too cold for them to really go anywhere. The reason I hesitate is that it's still possible that below the surface mm -hmm. of, of Titan, you know, way below the surface, there is a, a nice warm ocean in which perhaps some of these organics could be doing some interesting things. We absolutely have to and go back and we have to, to stay there, we have to study in detail the surface and also try and probe below the surface. Well there's so much to find out and one surprise follows another. Michel, John, thank you very much indeed. Meanwhile, Saturn's there, got to go and look at it and see those lovely wings for yourselves and a small telescope you'll see Titan and with a bigger one you'll see Enceladus too. I think Saturn is the most wonderful thing in the entire sky. Well, when I come back next month on April the 1st, it's going to be a very special program, the 50th anniversary of the sky at night. So do join us then. Good night.